30 Minutes with Ron. Hi, my name's Ron Gagliardi. I'm the host of 30 Minutes with Ron. And tonight we have a guest right here from Cheshire at Bavano of Cheshire. This is Jim Flood. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ron. Pleasure to be here. Bavano of Cheshire is a longtime Cheshire business. Started when? It actually started in 1952, uh, a long time ago, right here in Cheshire in a gentleman's home. His name was Jim Brower, and it was actually begun as the Brower Enamel Studio right here in Cheshire. Okay. Uh, Jim ran the studio for about two years in his basement. And then it moved to its current location in 1954. And that's when, really, Bovano of Cheshire began in 1954. Okay, now its current location is where? It's actually in South Main Street, 830 South Main Street, right here in Cheshire. Uh, anybody who's been by and sees the big red buildings down there knows Bovano. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of an icon in Cheshire. Uh, I always felt it was uh, very recognizable. Buildings mm -hmm. in, in the name itself is so unusual that uh, being associated with Cheshire has been a wonderful experience for many, many years. So. Oh, yes. Now, I moved to Cheshire in 72, and I would pass by the building, and I'd say, I know they do something nice in there artistically. And as an art teacher, I said, gee, I'd love to visit that building sometime. And I didn't get to visit it until, like, last year, and it was an amazing experience. But you mentioned the name Bavano, and I'm sure there's people out there who would want to know, how did the name Bavano come into existence? Well, there's a little story behind it, and I'll tell you quickly. Uh, oh, you uh, don't even do it quickly. <laughs> Take as much time as you want. There are three men who actually were recognized for starting the company, and their names were uh, John Bonsignor, uh, Gene Van Late, and Warden, Warren Noden. One of the men, it was not John, had uh, a very beautiful wife who came up with a name, and she said, how about the name Bovano? And the three men looked at this beautiful woman and said, oh, yes, that's a great name. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how the name actually was uh, formulated. They took the first two letters of each of their names, mm -hmm. the B-O, V-A from no, uh, Van Late, and N-O from Noden. And so that's how the name Bavano was uh, formulated. Um, and it was it really took hold. I think the name has helped it to the, the, the studio to, to continue on for many years because right. of this unusual name. Well, it is quite a st great studio, and I should mention that it does enamelized copper. That's what we're known for. Yes. For the entire life of the, uh, life of the, of the company, of the studio. All right, so what exactly is enamelized copper? How does it work? Well, uh, it's firing glass onto metal uh, is actually a centuries-old process. Uh, it's gone through a lot of transitions over the years, uh, but what it is, is primarily is taking um, a glass powders and fusing them to uh, different metals at very high temperatures. Um, and when you get up into the 1500 to 1600 degree Fahrenheit range, at that temperature, the glass will actually fuse into certain metals. Mm -hmm. And it's gone through a lot of changes over the centuries, but uh, I understand it was actually first found by the Greeks in around 2000 BC. That's how far back uh, glass enamels go. Uh, it comes in different forms. Um, the refrigerator in your house is done with actually porcelain enamel, where porcelain enamels are fired onto steel. Okay. But what we work in uh, are really known as jewelry enamels. And jewelry enamels are a very special kind of enameling because they use very beautiful glass materials that are formulated to fire onto only three metals, and those metals being gold, silver, and copper. Uh, and those are the three metals where you get the jewelry uh, finishes, the jewelry, uh, the beautiful jewelry-like glass uh, fired onto those three metals. Right. Uh, we primarily work in copper because of the price of the other two metals. Uh, we have worked in silver, but um, all three metals are wonderful to work with, easily formed, easily shaped, easily molded into whatever you'd like to construct them into before the glass is fused onto, the, onto those, those particular metals. And that's what enameling is all about. It sounds like a pretty intricate process. It is intricate. Uh, there, there's a lot involved in it. Uh, actually, the application of the glass is really the final step in trying to um, make a, a beautiful object. Uh, the, the, the metal itself, the metal working, is really the, the primary component in doing glass enamels. Mm -hmm. Because you can't, you, can't, you can't put the glass on until you have the right shape. Right. 
So um, it starts out with raw sheets of uh, either silver, or copper, or gold. And from that, um, those sheets are cut into various shapes and forms using mostly jewelry type of uh, uh, metal working processes. The, the metals are shaped into um, whatever it might be. And, and when you see some of the pictures of what Bavano does, you'll better understand uh, mm -hmm. what we're doing. Um, but it starts with an artist. An artist has to have the concept of what this thing is going to look like. Absolutely. Forgot that part, Ron. Oh, we can't forget. <laughs> I'm an old art teacher. i got to get that in there. It does. It starts with that, that initial uh, idea or conception of what is it that you'd like to create in glass enamels. And who knows where that idea will come from. It can come from uh, somebody speaking to you. It can come from an idea you might have. And that's the wonderful thing about art. It's you just don't really know where that idea is going to come from. Right. But when it does, and you're motivated to put it into a sculpture form or an art form, that's when Bovano uh, begins. That's when really the, the process begins. Yes, it is, a drawing is required. First, you do need to have a drawing uh, so that from that point you can uh, determine how you're going to actually cut and shape that metal. Mm -hmm. So from the artist's drawing, um, we go through a series of steps in order to, uh, to cut the metal. There's a lot of handwork done on the very first uh, sculptures. Uh, the metal is cut by hand, either with a scissors or, or, or jigsaws, um, or with plasma torches, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, when we want to make multiple pieces, however, we need to find a way to do it without using our hands, because our hands can only do so much work. So we have found a way of cutting the metal uh, in the chemical process. Uh, it's a process called chemical milling, where we can actually cut the metal out chemically. It's, it's a fascinating process. Yeah, when you told me about it originally, I was amazed at how you could do this. It is amazing. Um, John Bonsignor, the original uh, founder of Bovano, in 1965, he first learned of this process uh, and was fascinated by it as an engineer. He was primarily an engineer. Mm -hmm. And my father was a chemical engineer who had met John in 1959 and come to join John. And the two of them decided that they wanted this process at Bovano. So a small laboratory piece of equipment was purchased in 1965, mm -hmm. and that was the beginning of, uh, of the use of uh, uh, the chemical milling process. So I don't know how far you want me to go into this, well, Ron. I mean, but once I... you have the process <laughs> and the, the piece has been cut out, so you now have a flat piece of copper or, or silver or gold, yes. but usually copper for you guys. Then what do you do? Yeah, after it's, then it has to be formed. Um, and there's all kinds of ways of forming metal. And when I say form, it has to be shaped. Um, what we do is we, t we make a form uh, out of clay. And that, just like shaping clay with your hands, you can create a form fairly easily and mold it and shape it until it's what you want. Mm -hmm. And then we use a, a material, where it's called plastic steel actually, that we pour against that form, just like pouring a clay pot. Um, and that form then is uh, solidified and we use that for um, essentially pushing the metal into it with a, a forming press. Right. A very small forming press. So if you were doing a bird, you'd have a concavity of the body. That's right. By pushing the metal into That's that. right. right. Okay. In the early days, when Bovano was known for making only ashtrays, uh, which was a wonderful time period in the company, that was, forming was done with heavy steel presses, uh, the, where the press would actually, a 50-ton press would push that metal into a shape, mm -hmm. an ashtray shape, and, for, and actually stretch the copper until it conformed to that shape. Uh, I was fortunate to be part of that as a young young child when my father first got involved with it. Actually worked on those presses. I was always fascinated by the tools that were used to do it. Uh, the formings that we do now is a lot less uh, stressful in the metal, but it does exactly essentially the same thing. It mm -hmm. puts that roundness or that third dimension into the metal. Now that we have that dimension in there, uh, the next part of this is actually cleaning the metal. The metal has to be perfectly clean before the glass will adhere to it. So we have a couple of different methods. We've used different methods over the years of cleaning and brightening the metal uh, so that it's now ready to accept that glass powder. Mm -hmm. now, now we're ready to apply the glass. And in the glass enameling or jewelry enamels, there's, there's a number of different techniques that are used uh, to, um, to, to put the glass powders on. But it all requires your hands and the skill of your hands in order to do this. Bovano uh, has developed a bunch of different methods, um, but primarily it's sifted on almost like a salt shaker, putting like putting salt over your food. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that same thing uh, using glass powders. 
Every color in one of our pieces is a different glass powder. That's a little bit hard for some people to conceptualize as to where do these colors come from. Right. Uh, but it is the glass powders that are, are beautifully formulated so that when the powder fires at the 1600 degrees, that's when the color appears. Oh. Okay, so uh, now, we're, if I could just use my hands to show you, we're sifting each powder on. When we want a different color, we pick up a different powder and we sift that one on. And we, we sift it onto various areas of the form metal. Let's say it's a cardinal, bird. Yeah. So a cardinal has different shades of red. So for each shade, we'll use a different red powder. If we want to put a black beak onto the, onto the cardinal, we use a black powder. When all those powders are onto the surface, now we're ready to fire it and to make those colors appear. Mm -hmm. And that's the, one of the most fascinating parts of, of, uh, of, of the enameling craft or enameling process. Well, I've, I've seen it in person, and it, it is quite amazing. Uh, when you do this, how, how, how many do you do a day? Like, I'm sure there's certain kill size. How, how, how big is the kill? How many pieces can you do? Uh, that's... that's Good question. <laughs> it's a good question, Ron. Um, the kiln itself is about 20 inches by 24 inches in the center of it. Mm -hmm. It's a kiln. It's a kiln. Actually, we formulated and manufactured ourselves uh, to make it just exactly what we wanted around uh, 1985. Uh, the size of the kiln is important because it, it, it will change the way pieces are fired. Right. So we'll take a rack that's smaller than that 20 by 24. Usually, it's about 12 inches by 12 inches in size. The rack is made of stainless steel, so however many pieces we get onto the rack is one firing. So well, let's call that one firing. Right. So we have a rack that's approximately this size. We take uh, cardinal birds and we set them onto the rack. We can put eight cardinals onto that one rack. Now we're ready to fire that rack. And so when it's picked up by with a fork that looks something like a pizza fork yep. and sets it into the furnace, open the door of the furnace, set it in, and fire that. That cycle takes three to four minutes overall, that overall cycle okay. of firing. So how many of those cycles can we do in a day's time? Uh, how hard is it work to do? Uh, <laughs> how, many, how many pieces on here? That, that's the answer to your question, Ron, yeah. is how many pieces can do we done in a day? Okay. One thing you told me about pr previous to tonight was that the powders themselves are very hard to come by. That's very true. Where do you get them? Very true, Ron. Um, to my knowledge, um, there's only three companies in the world where you can get those powders that are immediately available to us. Uh, I don't know the entire world, but I do know these three companies are very important to the, uh, to the enamel craft. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is, fortunately, in uh, Kentucky. Uh, it's about a 70-year-old company that have been making glass enamels for many years. A second of them that's very important to us is located in Limoges, France and they make a beautiful glass, beautifully formulated. That's a 100-year-old company. And then there's a third one in Japan, uh, who I'm not that familiar with, but they, they also make very beautiful materials, but also very expensive. Mm -hmm. But they're all, all three companies make unusual colors, uh, colors being special formulations that they've developed so that when we want a blue color, that blue has a cobalt oxide in it in this case. The cobalt is what makes the blue color appear in the glass. Mm -hmm. Again, that blue does not appear until it's fired at that red hot temperature. And that's where the, uh, the chemical reaction occurs and allows that color to appear. Okay. So um, much as I would love to know their formulas, I'm sure they're never gonna tell me. Right. Uh, but it would be fascinating chemically to know how, how this uh, process is working. So yes, those three small companies, very small companies, I've been to both the company in Limoges and to the one in Kentucky a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, just fascinating people, uh, very hard to do, and very, they're very skilled at what they do in order to make this beautiful glass material. Right. And we're 100% dependent on those suppliers. Of course. Now, Bavana was well known around the country, and I even understand you have a couple of outlets in Europe. You're so well known that a TV company, or a TV production company, called you up and said, we want to put you on our show. Tell us about that. Very exciting, very exciting moment in time when they called that day and said they would like to film us. It was the Discovery Show, How It's Made. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, to be filmed nationally uh, was quite an exciting experience. This happened about three years ago. Uh, when it was all set up and when they were ready to come to uh, film us, they arrived at 6, six o'clock in the morning with two television crews filmed us all day long. Uh, we laughed and had fun. And we, I watched some very creative people do the work that they do. 
and then the, uh, it was aired about six months later, uh, one night on the, uh, the Discovery Show, mm -hmm. and uh, we were thrilled. We were yeah. very thrilled to have that happen because they've, what they've done is they've beautifully documented a, a beautiful craft, and now other people can understand more and can watch it and understand what I've been trying to tell you. Uh, because my words don't always convey exactly what happens, right. but in, and when you watch it in person, you can see that. Well, by coincidence, or actually by planning, we have the DVD of that. And Tremendous. we're gonna we're gonna air it right now. Tremendous, Ron. That's, right. that's great. Fantastic. Artisans handcraft these magnificent sculptures by fusing vibrant colors of finely ground glass to solid copper. First, the artist draws the design, then chooses the glass colors from a palette of hundreds of shades. She takes one element at a time and makes multiple copies of it on a sheet of paper. She has a lab produce a film negative, which she lays in an exposure machine. On top, she lays a silk screen coated with a light-sensitive chemical. It exposes them to halogen light for 90 seconds. The film negative works like a stencil. Its dark parts block the light from hitting the screen, while its clear parts allow light through. Where light penetrates, the light-sensitive chemical reacts and hardens. The unhardened chemical rinses away, leaving just the image behind. In the next department, they lay the screen in a silk screen printer, apply chemical-resistant ink, then load a sheet of solid copper about half a millimeter thick. The machine automatically prints the image onto the copper. They cure the ink in an oven for 20 minutes, then repeat the entire exposure process for the back side of the sheet. Next, they feed the sheet into a two-step milling machine. It applies chemicals that eat away any copper that isn't coated with the chemical-resistant ink. This cuts out the shapes. Then it strips off the ink, which by this point has served its purpose. Now they have a blank shape, but it's completely flat. To give it dimension, they stamp it with a forming die. Now the enameling process can finally begin. For each color grouping of the design, there's an aluminum stencil. They lay down the first one and sprinkle glass powder in the first base coat color, which looks white now, but comes out clear. Then a second stencil for the second base coat color, white. The shape then goes into a kiln for about a minute to liquefy the glass powder and fuse it to the copper. Once the base coat cools, they create the detail work with additional stencils and colors. This is where the true artistry comes in. Each shake of powdered glass is like a painter's brush stroke. Too much, and the color will come out too dark. Too little, and it'll come out too light. It takes an experienced enameler to get it just right. They craft dimension by blending colors and by combining different types of glass in the design, some transparent, some opaque, some opalescent. After every few powder applications, they return the piece to the kiln, where the intense heat, 870 degrees Celsius, liquefies and fuses the glass to the copper. Slowly but surely, they turn what was a blank copper shape into a vibrant work of art. Meanwhile, an artistic welder skillfully creates the sculpture's metal framework. In this case, branches on which copper enameled birds will perch. He's using steel, but frameworks can also be made of copper, bronze, or brass. Besides birds, this sculpture features copper enameled leaves and flowers. Their stems are bronze, because bronze fuses easily to steel. With the framework and background elements in place, it's just a matter of attaching the main design elements. 
some industrial strength hot glue does the trick. A modern twist on an ancient craft, these glass enamel sculptures make a glistening impression. Well, I think that shows what people would have been thinking about when you were saying it, and now they've actually seen it. Now you, you've seen the firing, you've seen the, uh, the powders being applied, you've seen the metal being cut, uh, and now maybe you can put that, all those pieces together in your mind and you, you can see all that goes into making uh, a, a Bavano piece, mm -hmm. what it takes to really, really make that piece. Well, let's talk about something else. There's a thing called the Made in Connecticut Guild that you were a major part of. And that led into something else. Let's talk a little about that. Tell us about the Made in Connecticut Guild. The Made in Connecticut Guild was actually formed as a result of a man by the name of Hank Payne, who was the owner of the Holland News Store in Waterbury. And he was uh, adamant about promoting Connecticut business, small Connecticut business. So he actually formed, helped to form this guild. And we all came together as small um, artisans, small business owners in the state of Connecticut trying to find a way for people to really appreciate the work that goes on in the state. Mm -hmm. So we did. We formed the Made in Connecticut Guild, and we ran it and tried and made every effort we could to promote it. What were uh, some of the companies that were in it? Uh, the uh, Woodbury Pewter was, was one of the companies, mm -hmm. Liberty Candle, um, uh, Mark Bieloff, who we were talking about before with his uh, wooden bow ties. Uh, there were a number of companies. There was a soap manufacturer, um, Wiffle Ball was part of the part of the uh, the guild. Mm -hmm. So those are the nature of the companies that um, uh, even Pez was part of it at one time. Yeah. Uh, well known companies that were are made here in Connecticut. And so anyway, we did do that for a number of years, about six or seven years. Uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but then we found that uh, we had to attend to our own businesses, and the guild kind of went into a dormancy. And that's when I met Euron. Ah, lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's evolved into a wonderful group now that's called MICA. Uh, MICA being uh, Made in Connecticut Arts. And now the, the Guild is focusing more on arts in Connecticut and the, um, the, uh, the very many, many creative people in the state. And how can we help them to, uh, to really become more of what they want to be uh, by, through, this, through the Made in Connecticut Arts? Mm -hmm. And so we have people from all over the state, different artists, different kinds of art, who are members of the group. And what MICA does is try to help them to become more well-known and to do better art. That's true, under your direction, Ron. And I, I'm really appreciative of that fact that you're taking on this, uh, to make this into what it is, what we want it to be, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it, as you and I both know, it started out of, uh, uh, out of the Bovano Fest last year, which uh, uh, was a wonderful experience where we had an art show. Uh, in, at, at Bovano location. And out of that, we decided that we should have a, an organization that continues this wonderful spirit on, to build on that spirit that, that, that really we felt at that, uh, that event last, last August. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a long time goal of mine to help other artists. I'm pretty good at getting publicity. Not, not that I like attention. Oops, I hate when I touch that microphone. Did it twice then. Uh, I, I, I did that myself fairly well for my own self, but I, I'm glad that I were able to help other artists and let them become more well known. Mm -hmm. And, it, and the, it's off to a great start. Uh, and it's, uh, the ways it's going to be able to help people um, is not all enumerated, they're not all listed out yet, but uh, if they contact Ron, they'll find ways, uh, believe me, there's, there's a way that Ron can help you. And I hope that uh, the, the group grows and, and expands and gets uh, larger and larger over the, next, over the coming years. Well, we do have a couple of websites, and they may show up on the screen. You never know when. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk a little about Bavano Fest. Bavano Fest was kind of like an idea that you had for some time. I, uh, was, I always felt as though, uh, I know it's happened a couple times in Cheshire, but uh, Bovano is such a, uh, it's a 63-year-old studio in Cheshire running continuously. I said, it's time for us to help other people do what we've been able to do. And that's where the idea came from. I do also go to a lot of art shows, um, but this, this was really about trying to find a way for the spirit of the arts to come into Cheshire. Mm -hmm. uh, very similar to what Ball and Socket is trying to create, in which I'm so admiring what they're doing there. But this is a small idea that um, we're trying to formulate a way of 
allowing artists to show their work and to be proud of it and to present it to everybody uh, to, 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 to see what they're doing. Uh, as most artists have to take so much pride and passion in what they're doing and their creativeness and their, their creative spirit, they really want other people to see it. That's what I feel about Bovano, <clears throat> and I know there's many other people out there like that. And this just gave them a venue, a way for them to do it. So well, we, should, we should let our viewers know that there is a Bovano Fest 2 coming up. It's yes. August 8th and 9th, a Saturday yes. and a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping to have even more vendors than we did last year. Uh, I think we had 25 vendors and then five booths that we gave out to groups like CPFA and the Cheshire Historical Society so they could tell their story. Yes. <clears throat> and and Ball Soccer was there also. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and we hope they will be back this year. And you had, you've been able to um, encourage some very notable artists to come to that Bohano Fest, Ron. Uh, I don't know if it's worth mentioning now, but uh, it really was an amazing event that I think people will be surprised. If you even find the time to come, you'll, you'll see something absolutely f uh, phenomenal going on right here in Cheshire. Well, one, I, of, one of Connecticut's finest artists, a muralist who lives in Cheshire named Tony Falcone, was there with his wife Judy Andrews, and uh, they had some amazing paintings to show, and they're hoping to be back this year. I just talked to them the other day, and they, they plan to be back for the two days. I'm occurred to hear that. Uh, yeah. Meeting Tony was a really exciting moment for me, uh, and it's, uh, it's just tremendous. He's been very supportive of Micah also, I know that. Uh, so that, that's the kind of thing that we... Uh, we'd like to see happening building on. Yes, now we also had a guest on this show named Bob Gomez who's involved with Micah, he's the president now, and he demonstrated a Gitler guitar on this show and he's going to be at Pavano Fest demonstrating the Gitler guitar and wow. he's also going to bring his extensive collection of guitars that, that they're beautiful and so there's, they're going to be on display and he and his son Antonio are going to be playing jazz, he on the guitar and Antonio on the saxophone. Fantastic. So they're going to be some of Fantastic. our musical guests and uh, we're hoping to have a band, uh, we've, we've already scheduled them, called the No Tattoo Band. <laughs> Tremendous. Yes, now, th there's a little bit of a story to that name. There's six guys in the band. They're all over 50, and some of them are in their 60s and 70s, and there's not a tattoo among them. Fantastic. So well, they thought, let's okay. call ourselves the No Tattoo Band. But are we going to be any, any tattoo artists at the show? Uh, you, you never know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful venue. We might get a tattoo artist just to come and share his or her wares. Yeah. There was such a variety of artists and artisans there. Uh, there was one woman I remember who came out of out of hiding, essentially, had not done any artwork in many years, yeah. and it was a thrill to have her there at the yeah. show. Huh? So. All right, so it looks like it's time to wrap up. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being with us, Jim. Okay. Thank and you, Ron. thank you for viewing thank the you. show, for viewers out there. And I hope you tune in next time. Thanks again. Bye-bye.